You are watching Area DMG. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Symposium on brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> we need a volunteer. <laughs> Can you get me the scalpel, please? Use this instead. Today we'll be doing neurosurgery. <laughs> Who saw Get Out? No, I'm kidding. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to Sunday morning. Woohoo! Okay, uh, who got sleep? Who got sleep? Anybody? Uh, who didn't get any? Yeah, because we didn't. Bravo. Uh, that's con success. <laughs> that's achievement unlocked. Where are you? There you are. Good morning, hey. Hey. See, we meet people here, and they're all done up in, uh, you know, in caps and, and, and chic uh, hats, and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, look at your hair! That's <laughs> gorgeous." Unfurled. I know. Fantastic. Thank you all for being here on a Sunday morning. We're gonna just go nice and cash today. Yeah, and sorry for crashing now. We <laughs> <laughs> had nowhere else to go. Actually, it's a legal requirement. He has to be next to me within five feet at all times. There's an attachment there. There is. He gets a, an electronic zap if he's too far away. <laughs> Which is really nice. For me, because I have control over it. So sometimes when I get bored, I just... I'd like to enjoy it, though, over the years. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, we alternate where it actually goes on his body. So that's... Oh. Too soon? Too soon? No such thing as bad scar tissue, bro. <laughs> Yes. It's a happy movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's very happy. Lying. Along with Get Out, that's a happy movie too. <laughs> very happy movies. I gotta say I'm a little melancholy, baby. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. It was so it. good. I liked it. Yeah, except for the, the guy who was snoring in the... Oh, right. <laughs> you guys have interesting places that you take naps. Because uh, there was a guy in the front of the theater who was full on... <laughs> <laughs> At a really important, quiet part, and the whole crowd started laughing, and I was like, <laughs> and I'm just thinking to myself, wouldn't somebody wake him up? I mean, you could hear him in the back row. You would think, wouldn't somebody sitting next to him go, you know, Mom, Mom, you're snoring, you know, or somebody? Plug his nose and his mouth until he either expired or woke up. That's me. That is me. Voice. Yeah. Well, there was, there was a guy sitting next to me, too, who, who made more noise with a popcorn bag than I thought was humanly possible. Oh, you don't think they make that much. But it was... And then moved on to the M&M's bag. It was just great. You know, so we started with the low decibel and then continued to move up. Yeah, so it was a great experience. We loved it. <laughs> we'll see it again. We missed out. But there was no Sam Jackson at the end of the movie. I was really sad. Like, at the end of every movie, we stay for the credits, and I expect to see Sam Jackson at the end of every movie. I realize that people who haven't seen her are not going to stay now for the credits. So now you, know, you don't have to stay to the end of the credits because yes. there's no special yeah. scene. But do get there early because there's a fun intro. Bless you. That's true. And thank God he can just shut up. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I am no longer fashionably late. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. Yes, Welcome. Come on in. And I can come at any time. <laughs> there is no late. And we have said nothing Louise. of value. Yes, we've said nothing of value. Nor will we, because it's Sunday. That's right. Sunday, <laughs> Sunday. We're always glad that anybody shows up on a Sunday. It's so nice. We really appreciate that. I know that you've been partying with guts out through the whole weekend. So. At least I hope so. <laughs> Who went to the rave last night? Oh, wow. And you're awake. You're and alive. This is even better. <laughs> you did after the, the drag show? Oh, yeah. man. Awesome. You guys are awesome. So whose first time is it at Colorado Anime Fest? Wow, oh my gosh, amazing. that's amazing. Wow. So are you guys, do you guys all live in Colorado? Or are you, uh... Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah? yeah. Yep. No, so have you gone to Nanda's con in the past? I have yeah. not. That's a great con too. I really love it. You guys are so wonderfully nice here. I know I probably should talk about other cons here, but there's so many people from Nanda's con here uh, as well. So it seems like now you've got it's like having a spring and fall rent fair. You know, it's like it's it's a great to get one you know twice a year to be able to come and meet everybody. Which is nice. 
Yeah. Bent. Yeah. So are there any questions that we haven't answered for you yet? Does yeah. anybody have, have no idea who we are? Yeah. <laughs> we just decided to come yeah, here. Yeah, who we are? That's awesome. I'm, yeah, I know where you are. Oh, okay. oh no, that's awesome. We love that. Yeah, yeah. Alright, so I have a question for Mary. I yes, have... yes, I love those. Okay, she knitted me the most incredible. What are they called? Dragon scale. Dragon scale uh, go, uh, fingerless gloves is what they were. Dragon wearing. scale fingerless gloves, and they're green, so they actually look like a green dragon. Yeah. And, uh, or whatever mood you're in, they could look like a mermaid too. They're exquisite. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. And since I just got resorted into Slytherin, uh, they're kind of perfect. <laughs> Because I was Gryffindor. I was a Lannister in Gryffindor, which I thought was a nice yin yang. And then uh, I just I went on to Pottermore, and but I did like the 140 question one on the internet, and I was Gryffindor. I did the 10 question, you know, dark or light, and all of a sudden I'm Slytherin. I'm like, and I mean, my Patronus is a shrew. How awful is that? <laughs> awful. So I put in another. Um, I resorted myself with a new email address, and I got a garden snake. I'm like, anyway. I've been uh, listening to Liam and Sam's podcast, All Work, No Play. Yes. And so I understand you guys are like super busy, but um, my question is, when you get a chance to be on Critical Role again, are you going to drag Steve along? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would love to. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's kind of intimidating to go on. I mean, I, I think the first time I went on was like a year and a half ago to Critical Role. There's, do you guys know about Critical Role? Woo! It's yeah. awesome. Role for initiative at all times. Where are the dice? There's no dice dealer. And I love your hoodie. Yes, the softest hoodie in the world. Um, I, I love going to conventions because I always like finding new dice. It's really fun. But there are new dice dealers. It was really excited. Anyway, there's a, a Thursday nights. It's called Critical Role. And you watch some nerdy ass voice actors, which is they are self described by Matt Mercer, uh, play Dungeons and Dragons. And it's full on role playing with some of your favorite, or if not, you know them, voice actors Travis Willingham, Laura Bailey, Liam O'Brien, Sam Regal, Talison Jaffe, Marisha Ray, and Ashley Johnson. Uh, and now Ashley's boyfriend Brian Foster does Talks Machina, and we've started our own home game, which is really fun, which we're hoping to... But we're at level two. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah. And level two. And Critical Role is what, level 17? Uh, They're gonna start throwing planets at each other next week. <laughs> I mean, if they can get through hell, the nine hells, they're gonna start. Somebody did tweet yesterday, he's like, why did Zara go down and meet them? And that's like, just because she is one doesn't mean she knows anything about it. And I said, yeah, but I would totally bring the fire, water, and beer, y'all. <laughs> so I keep hoping, keep bugging Matt, to, I'd love to go, but Will and I would love to go back on. I just don't want to kill our friends. So I want to learn a little bit more about it. She's a, she's a much better student than I am. So before she went on Critical Role for the first time, she sat with the book and she studied and studied and studied for weeks before you went on the show. I'm not that dedicated to any. So if I can just go on and... and uh... Oh, I'm dedicated to you. You're beyond dedicated. This is not going well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you on the other side. But I was thrown in at level, level 11 after uh, never playing before with a warlock, which was like, what am I doing? You know, uh, and got very lucky. Laura Bailey is still mad at me that I have now killed an adult white dragon and a beholder. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's so much fun. We're having, we, play, we play our game again this week, and I'm so excited. I play uh, Griffin, who is a, a wild sorcerer, and her, she doesn't know that she's a wild sorcerer because she was cursed. She's an Aladrin half-elf, sunny Aladdin. Uh, her evil uncle like cursed her, so she doesn't know that she's cursed. So this other side, whenever the DM makes me roll for the wild magic, this, this character in the jersey, how the frick are you guys doing? And she comes, casts a spell, and then goes away back to Griffin, who is based on Queen Elizabeth from The Crown. So it's quite a nice, quite a nice mix. Schizophrenic wild sorcerer. It's fun. I'm a dwarf barbarian who's constantly drunk. So <laughs> yeah, very, very much based on Ogren from Dragon Age, but with a, with a bunch of really weird twists to it. Yes hair that's in dreadlocks that has a mind of its own. Um, with every emotion, it sort of does something different. It was born with a tail, that, sort of like a stubby little tail. tail and, uh, I'm going to put a bed on it soon. Yeah. So we can keep track. Keep track of our chats. Yes, yeah. 
He's a moonshiner too, which is kind of nice. <laughs> well, what's fun is our DM has put us in the world of the old Dungeons and Dragons um, uh, animated cartoon, mm, nice. uh, which is really fun. So we're currently searching for Presto's hat. Nice. That is our current quest, and we're not doing very well. Uh, <laughs> but I did a water elemental rose when I was in the room alone, and I was like, I can't sleep. And the water elemental went right down, and I was like, Come on. <laughs> I'm at level two, I'm very squishy. I will die. Yeah. D&D's awesome. I find as I'm getting older, I'm becoming more a bigger nerd than I thought humanly possible. And I love it. It's so much fun. Like, I, just... I admire your nerd. It's, it's all good. And yeah, we buy each other weapons for, <laughs> yeah. for holidays and birthdays and things now. So we've got swords and portable torture devices. <laughs> <laughs> We will. We're working on that. Yes. <laughs> Every day. a blacksmith, and we're going to ask him to create some really weird. Yeah. Well, he's creating a sword for Zara, uh, which has a white dragon handle, uh, the head of a white dragon, and then the, the blade is sort of curved, and it's going to have Wendy Doodles, who uh, Wendy Sullivan, who's one of the great artists for Critical Role, and also for Tangled, the series, which premiered last month, two nights ago. Please watch every week, it's wonderful, Steve's on it. Uh, is doing all the artwork for the, the blade design itself. So it should be fun. Hopefully in time for Ren Fair, but probably not. Anyway, yeah, in the back. So if, if you guys get weapons for each other, what's your favorite weapon that you, from your characters that you've had, that you just had to get in real life? We haven't done that yet. No, we just I started. want to get him a, a, a bucket head, Attila. He plays the, the pub club, Attila Buckethead, uh, who has a very interesting, uh, no, it was mentioned in the song, uh, in, the, in the original movie, you're a pastry, pastry guy. Yes. 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 So, uh, but it's this giant, it, it looks like a giant bucket with horns on it. Uh, and that's what uh, we're gonna get yeah, It's you. literally just a, a steel, whatever that's made of, a steel paper with a little handle and two horns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're gonna have that custom made at some point. Yeah, but uh, Steve got me a broad, uh, crusader sword for, uh, for my character in Diablo 3 last year. It's this giant broadsword. And I felt like such a badass walking to Ren Fair. I actually went as the crusader. I was like, I don't feel like putting on a corset. <laughs> I'm just put on, you know, one of those things. It was fun. Yeah. More weapons to come? Yes. Question? No, uh, oh, I forgot. I forgot. I forgot. Okay. Did you have a question? Wait, wait, wait. Sure. Uh, Does that mean where you're going to be? Where you're taking me or you're implying there's every such thing as a sober dwarf? <laughs> Ask Will we No. <laughs> I don't know enough about this to comment on that, honestly, so. No, uh, the main question is uh, about voice acting. Um, when you did major though, how hard is it to do a character that's as serious and with like and ideas that Ghost in the Shell brings about the condition? Yeah, the Ghost in the Shell movie's coming out, and I played the major in uh, the series. Uh, Ghost of uh, Standalone Complex, seasons one or two. And we did two movies and all these games, and now we're still doing First Assault online. Um, and she was really interesting to go in to, to voice act. One, just because normally I get all the villains because I have a really deep voice and I don't do really high and stuff, which is usually what all the ingenues are, all of our female leads are, you know, they're very high and everything, and I live in a much deeper place. So to actually use my own voice for a character that was not a villain was sort of fantastic. Uh, and then to play someone who was really in search of who she was in a world of technology that had sort of surpassed our own humanity and, and where she finds her place now. You know, does she want to live in the net? Is she attached to Bateau enough to stay? Uh, she explored things that I never explored as an actor uh, in anything really before. So it was a fascinating journey to go on with her. Uh, and it was just fun to play a badass female, you know, that wasn't a, an, a villain. Uh, normally I'm drinking wolf's blood and, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know so it was really wonderful to, to sink my teeth in, into her. And I hope the movie's good. Oh, man. I, I hope the really movie's good. Movie is good too. I, I, yeah. I, 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 skepticism, that's all I have. I know. Me too, but because... It, but the, the creator gave, you know, his, his seal of approval on Scarlett Johansson and... It looks gorgeous, so yeah. we'll see. It's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, stay hopeful. Like you can tell, its budget is there and all. Yeah, that. yeah. And, yeah. And
I mean, that's the thing. I just hope the execution's good. It's all right. It's all right. But yeah, my question was, I just had the weirdest question in mind. What would happen if Roger Smith talked with Matoko? Roger Cranston? No, no, no. no. <laughs> hey, Rod. It's always showtime with her. Um, uh, well, it's, there would be a lot of negotiation involved, I suppose. Yeah. Um, how big is your gun? <laughs> And do you know how to use it? Let me show you my robot, how about that? Ah, we will definitely talk. <laughs> I like this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Alright, so um, this is for you, Mary Elizabeth. Um, what, if you had to choose to play any other character in Steven Universe besides Dr. Mahesh Warren, um, which one would you choose and why? Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, Patty Lapone is playing an amazing character, and I think I would play her because she's just—I mean, Patty Lapone is such a badass. <laughs> somebody, uh, she was doing Gypsy on Broadway, and uh, somebody was there taking pictures of her with her phone. She stopped the show and said. Stood there at the edge of the stage. <laughs> you can imagine Patty the Pony goes, Some people are da 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 da. Who do you think you are? <laughs> you can watch this on YouTube. It's terrifying. <laughs> you know, the audience just goes, oh. <laughs> And the audience shrank three sizes that day. <laughs> So I would, you know, I would do anything to, to walk in her footsteps. Yeah. Or play Steven, he's fine. <laughs> or Connie, Connie is so brave. I just love that, that she's just this brave, that she teaches her mom so much. This woman who is so educated and, you know, this brilliant doctor and yet an overprotective. Uh, well, I think seeing that your daughter is basically, you know, <laughs> running around with aliens and, and fighting them with a sword. A sword, Connie! You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty fantastic. So, but for her to learn something from her daughter is, is an amazing thing. Where are you going? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes! In the wrong room. What else? What else? Yeah. Oh, Lordy. Uh, were there any roles that you wanted really bad, and I'm talking about across any medium, that you would love to voice, or even act? Oh. Big question. Ripley from Alien. <laughs> She's my favorite. <laughs> oh, I love her. I'm so obsessed with Alien that I had a cat that I actually got this tattoo for. Uh, Jones, for 16 and a half years, my baby girl, my held her, she went away from us. Uh, and then a week later, I found these two little gray uh, silver Maine Coons, uh, and the first thing Ash did was bite my finger, so I'm like, well, you're Ash, and you'll be Bishop. So I've got Ash and Bishop right next to you, and they have fallen madly in love. Yeah, they both bite me. <laughs> <laughs> Ash demands to be, uh, to use you as a, a tree, is basically Yes, I am. Times. I am the cat poster. <laughs> <laughs> that is my function in the house. And they're both about 20 pounds, and he will start to climb you if you don't pick him up when he wants to. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. He does his evil power purr, too. It's like, <laughs> 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 violent purring. You have to, <laughs> it's the name of our new thing. Violent purr. Violent purr. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. The violent purr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the intro, just no one long fur. Aracuda! But Ripley, to go a long way back. I love Ripley. I think she's she's probably my favorite, uh, hands down, favorite female character, I think, in anything outside of Shakespeare. I mean, she's just unbelievable. Or Galadriel, that would be lovely. But I, I did Galadriel in a online game, so I got to do the One Ring speech, which was really fun. <laughs> but Ripley's it. I, uh, we finally, I got Steve and I a PS4 a year and a half ago, and I just unpacked it. Uh, and got Alien Isolation, but I'm too chicken scared to play it. I hear it's really scary. Right? Yeah, it's scary. Right? Yeah. 
that AI is a cheating bastard, though. <laughs> really? Even on easy, I mean, I am. Um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. And that, it, they, they deliberately made it that way, too. They made it so like, they yeah. really, it was like. But there's an add on that has Ash, Kane, Ripley, yeah. Dallas, Lambert. Yeah. 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 Parker yeah, and good. Brett. Oh, I got them. Yeah. Oh, I did. I know. I love them. I'm so sad that John didn't pass this year. Only because, you know, everybody was doing me at the beginning of 2016 and me at the end of 2016, and mine was John Hurt at the beginning of Kane, and John Hurt at the end of Kane. You know, just <laughs> coming out. So, it was my yeah. How about you? Who are you? Uh, well, I've been so lucky with the characters that I've gotten to voice, I never think about the ones that I haven't. Yeah. So, it's, every day is a surprise for me. Uh, the one exception to that, I think I would have been right for, just with my natural voice print for Batman. Early, in, early on in my career, I thought, well, I, I could do Batman. And then I hear Kevin Conroy do it, and I went, oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I could do a version of it, but it's not going to be better. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just I'm so grateful for every character that I get to play. And I, and I did get to play Lego Batman, the nonverbal version of him in the original game. So I could go out and buy the action figure. And that was all me, so I'm good. I don't have a lust after anything else in my life. <laughs> yeah, that's right answer. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Yeah. So you mentioned you forgot a PS4. What's your favorite game to play? I played one. I sat down because I got a terrible cold last week. That's what you get from cleansing. If all these toxins come out, you get sick. You're like, <laughs> that's wrong. Uh, so Brian Foster came over and plugged it in because I don't know how to do any of that and uh, set it all up for us. And he said, there's, uh, I downloaded Horizon, and I downloaded Alien Isolation, and he said, and there's a D&D game that's free called Neverwinter. I played Neverwinter for eight hours straight. And I did not stop. I would have played all night if I could, and this is, why, this is probably why we didn't plug it in for a year and a half, because we both have sort of this fixated personality on, oh, this is fun. Let's do this for hours, you know? And, and, and I did, I am now, Frey was a control wizard who was riding a ghost horse that's armored, and she's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. And I haven't played yet. <laughs> I haven't played anything yet. It's really hard, because, you know, I'm working on six shows plus two games of Blizzard, so when I finish work, we come home, and, and I've got more work to do. I've got to write up, you know, scripts, uh, mark up all the scripts for Tangled, and mark up all the scripts for uh, the Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Show and that's all just you know and so it's it's and so by the time I'm done I just sort of sit down and I'm like where's a cooking show where's a, where's a tiling show where's flip what is it oh uh, those great people from Waco flip or not flipper flop the fixer upper oh, yeah. I'll just turn on fixer upper and watch those two I'm like they're so cute together <laughs> oh, look at her style you know it's like I just need kind of mindless stuff so and I know if I get into Neverwinter. I just can't play it for an hour. I'm gonna play it for four hours, and then it's three in the morning, and I'm gonna get up and work. Uh, What's your favorite game? Oh, go. Oh, me? Okay. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Same. <laughs> so, so I'm a bit of a nerd, so I like to go back to Fire Emblem for the Game Boy. Nice. 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 Uh, I've always been a Final Fantasy fan. Yay! Especially Final Fantasy XIII, so... Well, uh, Troy Baker uh, dropped me off a bridge. Thanks for that. Uh, uh, you were a badass before you went, so... I know. And I love you, Troy. <laughs> you threw me off a freaking bridge. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. I love all the Final Fantasy games. And you did. You were Vincent. Thank you. Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, I got to whisper through an entire game. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Scott, on Vincent for a moment, are you, uh, if you're offered up the chance to return as Vincent for the Final Fantasy VII Remake, would you yes. do it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like I have been sitting waiting for the phone call. Was, yeah, I've got it on high alert right here. Uh, no, I've made it very public that I would love to work on it, but it, it's not my character, I don't own it, so yeah. if they call me, they call me, if not, then some, probably one of my friends would get it, so that yeah. would cheer them on. Awesome. But yeah, in, in a heartbeat. It's one of the few game characters that I ever played that didn't hurt. <laughs> it, was, it was like a, a, a warm down exercise through the entire thing. It was, it was so comfortable and fun and beautiful to look at. So yeah, I do it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then Catherine. It's, uh, like I, uh, it's kind of like a, it's kind of in response to like what I did yesterday regarding uh, when, when I met you guys at the signing. Yeah. I told you guys like uh, and, uh, Karen not too long ago, like people like you and uh, people who work in the industry like you, who work as hard as you do, you help inspire me to do what it is I want to do as I, as I can dream career. I actually plan on being a writer and yeah. other like authors like Neil Gaiman and Catherine Applegate, who I sent a letter to that said, pretty much said, saying like a thank you note as to what she did working on the Animorph series. And I actually got a response back from her, by the way, wow. saying like, oh my god, that was amazing. So, That's awesome. But yeah. I just wanted to know, what is it though, who are the people that help inspire you to do what it is that you do every day? You? <laughs> Literally, lately, I mean, you guys are the biggest inspiration for us. I mean, in, in terms of the industry, which I know is what the real question is, but that is the actual accurate answer. Um, for me, it was people like Frank Welker, uh, Dee Bradley Baker, Mel Blanc, uh, these luminaries who are not only great voice actors, but they're really nice people. Really, really good people. That, that's, those are the people that I gravitate towards. If they're, if they're not a nice person and they walk into the room with a big ego, I have no time for that. Right? <laughs> it kind of crushes me. So you gotta, you gotta be careful when you're meeting your heroes. Oh yeah, but I was when I met you too. Oh, I'll do that. Oh, <laughs> I know you're so good. Really you know. <laughs> yeah, but fortunately in our, in our neck of the woods, voice actors are generally really nice people. So most of the ones that, that we've met have become our dear friends. We're like one big dysfunctional family. <laughs> we keep in touch with each other no matter where we are in the world. It's, it's really amazing. And, uh, and, and a lot of them are these luminaries whose careers that we've been following since we were little. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of lucky that way. Yeah, Chuck Jones, Carl Stalling, uh, Andrea Romano for me as a director. Oh my gosh. I mean, uh, Chris Zimmerman. I mean, there's so many female directors now, which is really kind of amazing. Um, Colette Sunderman. I mean, I'm, I'm just so happy to be in, in their company now as a director. And as an actor, I mean, Sigourney Weaver. Um, Kate Blanchett, Katherine Hepburn, uh, Judy Dench, uh, all the Brits up and down. I just, <laughs> all the Brits, all of them, all the Brits. Uh, when I, I lived a year in London and I got to uh, see a lot of theater in London. And what's great is they have student prices and it's really cheap, or at least it was for students. Uh, and the, the person that sort of got me interested in Shakespeare was Derek Jacobi. He did a version of Hamlet years ago with Patrick Stewart as Claudius, and uh, it was so good, and I was so blown away, and I got to meet him, and I just burst into tears. I was such an idiot. He did a, uh, uh, he was doing a play called Breaking the Code that uh, was based on Alan Turing, which Kenneth Benedict Cumberbatch just did the movie of, uh, which I forget the name of. He was nominated for Imitation Game. Imitation, Imitation Game. Game, right. So it was all about the, the Turing machine and all of that. And I met uh, Derek Jacobi afterwards, and I just burst into tears. I was like, <laughs> I said, I, and he says, oh, that's so lovely, thank you. And if you ever want to talk about theater, and I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, come by Saturday, I'm doing a matinee, and we'll talk in between matinees. So I went up into his dressing room, we sat and talked about Shakespeare, and it was just, and I still remember what he said, and the advice and everything else, and he inspired me to keep going, so, and to keep trying, and, and to keep failing. Because I realized that in this industry, and maybe in most of our lives, the greatest thing that we can, do is fail because we learn so much from that and then to get up and keep going is a test of your character so you fail you get up you fail again you get up and then you succeed and then you fail again and, uh, so not to get caught in the failures just keep going because failures actually might end up teaching you more than success a lot more a lot more, a lot more yeah. yeah i try to fail every day and you do it so well thank you, thank you. <laughs> as do i yeah. Yeah. So, Steve, you mentioned earlier that you really like playing Vincent Valentine because he doesn't hurt your voice. That just reminded me, uh, Vic Mignogna likes to say that he knows every time he's got a contract to play Broly because his, his agent just calls him up and says, Vic, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have characters that your agents call you up, both of you, and just apologize for you having to play them because they know it's going to suck? No, because it's still I'm still lucky to get to do it. I don't really have that perspective. And, and something like Broly, 
I mean, not only is he screaming his guts out, but he's not going to pay very well for it. You know? so, uh, so fortunately for, for me, when I'm doing characters, like Wolverine is a great example. Whenever I play Wolverine, I know it's going to hurt, but I also know I get to play Wolverine. And uh, I'm at the point in my career where I can limit those sessions to two hours, so I know I'm not going to do permanent damage. <laughs> or if I'm in the middle of the session, I feel some damage happening, I'll just stop the session. I couldn't always do that in my career. So I never get upset, nor does my agent, if that kind of thing is, is coming up. And in fact, if there is something that comes up that says uh, that it's going to be vocally stressful and there's really not much character development, I'll actually turn it down at this point, because there's no point in ruining my throat for that. Um, but yeah, I, that's that's never even an issue for me anymore. And when those, especially the characters that I love come up, I'm willing to, to go there. Call of Duty is another example. I, I will scream my guts out for Tank Dempsey just because it, it merits it for that character. And you can't do it any other way, unfortunately. <laughs> Eight agents are never upset when you book a job. No. Let's just be honest about that one. If they're calling up saying, I'm sorry, they're like, no, you got to the job. I mean, so, uh, yeah, no, I haven't. I did one thing that Liam directed. It was a Resident Evil game where I played the zombie queen with all these boobs, and I um, <laughs> just knew that I was going to be. Uh, I just, like, I've been working with Dee Baker, and, and, and Dee plays his face, like, he plays different resonances in his face. And it's fascinating to watch him do that. And I thought, I wonder what that is like. So I decided to do it was this big zombie queen. So I just thought, you know, I'm just going to experiment and see what kind of new sounds I can make. Uh, knowing that I don't have to sing this month, I don't really have anything else I'm just directing, so I'm gonna trash it and just see what I can do, you know, which is a really stupid thing. It's like <laughs> running your car into the ground just to see what would happen, but we did that and it was fun and it took a month to recover. Yeah, but experimentation is good too, and then that's another example of failing. Sometimes you might find gold in doing oh, that. Yeah. I did that watching D also. It's, it's really fascinating. He's literally, literally manipulating the cavities and sinuses when oh. he's recording. And he'll be doing <laughs> But then he'll, I don't know how he does it. It doesn't work for me. I have bones there. Maybe he's just big flesh. <laughs> it's like he's playing his face like a lute. Or like Spock might read your mind. Yeah. You know, it's just ooh, so strange. Yeah, he played a Godzilla-sized fire-breathing chicken on Pet Zero. It's coming up. And you know, I put out a video of D saying, and now a giant fire breathing chicken. And off he went into Godzilla chicken sounds breathing fire and in the middle of all of it too. I've never seen anything like it. The guy's an absolute genius. So that's the kind of like experimenting and, uh, and fun that uh, we don't get to do in any other job, really. You know, it's, it's kind of fascinating to go in and, and play in a vocal sandbox all day, so my agent never really apologizes. He just apologizes when I don't have time. I was like, well, how about, they can, you know, we've got to do a, an ISDN with uh, James Monroe Englehart, who's currently uh, rehearsing for Hamilton, and he's on Tangled. Uh, he's playing Lance Strongbow, which is coming up uh, next week, I think. And uh, we've got to record him at 7 or 8 a.m. this week, because he's got Hamilton rehearsals, you know, so we're all like, are you kidding me? We're so excited for him. We'll come in at any time of the day because he gets to go on as Jefferson and Lafayette. So, oh, wow. I know how awesome. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. Yes. We just had a warm-up singing Sail Away in the, uh, <laughs> the thing. Uh, I think it would be uh, uh, the room, uh, room of Angel. Um, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, you lie silent there before me. Your tears may mean nothing to me. The wind howling at the the love you never gave, I give to you. <laughs> and I've just fallen in love again. What's <laughs> fun is we've been doing stuff from Cowboy Bebop, which is really fun, and like singing some of like the songs from. We were at a Hawaii uh, convention and. Uh, 
they serve Mai Tais in Hawaii. <laughs> Who knew? So we had a Mai Tai and Steve and I got these really awful ukuleles and they were so fun. They wouldn't stay in tune, made out of plastic. Oh, uh, so good. All the waterproof. So, all the <laughs> so we had a Mai Tai and went up to our panel uh, because they encouraged that. You know. And so we're sitting there in our bathing suits and you know cover-ups and the Mai Tai and we, we did uh, Blue from Cowboy Bebop. Steve played the you can we all. Melissa Bond came up and we all sang together. It was really fun. Yes. Hopefully we'll do more of that stuff too. That's, that's really fun. Yeah. Love it. Love that. Yeah. Anything that pays us <laughs> will do. Uh, I don't know, you know, there's something to be said for working on like Final Fantasy and walking in and just like, oh my god, I got to be on Final Fantasy! Or Star Wars Rebels coming into season three as Governor Price, just, you know, trying not to wet my pants as I go into the studio for the first time with everybody, you know, and, and oh my gosh. So there's something definitely, definitely to be said for that. But then there's also something really cool to be a part of like Steven Universe. Who knew that was going to go anywhere? And now it's this wonderful, amazing show. So it's, uh, I don't know, there's something to be said for being in something that is completely brand new and all of a sudden just takes off. And you didn't expect it to. Yeah, you have to kind of treat every character that you're put for with the same respect, no matter what the franchise is. Because like she said, you never know where the franchise is going to go. And then you're hired to do that job anyway, so whether you're Soldier A or you know the lead in some amazing giant franchise, you have to put just as much into that in that moment. Otherwise, why bother going in? That's that's just been my philosophy anyway. I, you know, if, if you're going to go and do Broly, you're going to scream as loud and hard and well as you possibly can because that's what the character requires. So. Yeah, but it is pretty fun work on Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, critical roles. Steve, so you said you would love to play Batman. Can you can you give us our Batman? <laughs> I'm Batman. <laughs> Harvey Dent. <laughs> Christian Bale. I love Christian Bale. Where is he? Where is he? <laughs> I'll never do that. Harvey Dent. <laughs> Yeah. I was wondering, uh, how did you, did you do a lot of singing before the Silent Hill games, and how did you uh, get involved in those? Yeah, I've been singing my whole life, my whole family sings, we get together with Yvonne Traps, we, uh, we sing in four-part harmonies and dad brings sheet music during the holidays, and we sing, and we go Christmas caroling every uh, Christmas Eve, and we've always, I was in the church choir, I was in uh, all-state choirs and magical groups, and it was just a way to keep my sanity, I think, was singing, always was. And my first job in L.A. Uh, was singing, uh, two jobs, was uh, singing at the Smokehouse across from Warner Brothers, which is a great old place, uh, and then singing in the Beetlejuice Rock and Graveyard Review at Universal Studios Hollywood, where Dee Bradley Baker came in my second year there as one of the Beetlejuices. Uh, and um, so I've been singing my whole life. I started working for Zero Limit Productions that did Akira and Ghost in the Shell and Cowboy Bebop, and I'd been working for them for a number of years, and I think I had already done the song for Ace Combat Zero at that point, and they said, hey, we've got this project, you wanna you know, do a singing audition for this new game? And I said, sure, and I got it. And I heard the songs, and I thought, to Akira, I asked him, I said, I'm, I'm interested why you would choose me to do this, because these songs are sort of high, and, or too lyrical, they, they don't seem to fit my voice, and he said, that's why. Because you've got such an interesting voice, and it, it, offs, it makes it sound a little bit off, uh, in the sense that that's what Silent Hill is about. It's about the light and the dark together, the cold and the hot together. It's about something that's just not quite right. So if you're singing the letter, and it's too high for you, and it comes up breathy and sort of strange, that's the mood that I want to set with this song, and with all of them. And uh, that's how I got into it. And, we hopefully will start doing some, uh, we've been talking about doing an album, which would be great, a new album. But we, we've been touring in, uh, all over the world, which is kind of fun. Last year we did France and Russia, and we went back to Russia. Russia's big these days, who knew? Anyway, yeah. Huge in Russia. Huge, we're huge in Russia. <laughs> Nostrovia. Uh, <laughs> yeah, look at the back. 
Next question. Uh, <laughs> I did it to you yesterday, too. Sorry, this is Mary's panel. I'm just here for eye candy. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was really funny. Uh, that session was really difficult. We could never figure out who was supposed to be voicing whom because it wasn't clear in the writing and the writers were there and they got confused too. So and yeah, that, that session took twice as long as pretty much any other Wolverine session I've ever done before. Um, I think it came out pretty, pretty well though in the end. But yeah, we were, everybody in the room was confused. At one point, we just had to stop the session, go take a break and everybody had to breathe and sort of consult to figure out what we were supposed to do. And we would, uh, one of us would read the line, the other would copy it for each character and, and um, just to get the right inflection and all that. And, um, and we were still confused even after doing that. But yeah, it was really fun. We had a great time doing that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, uh, just in terms of like being directed or being a director, like what are some of just the most helpful notes you've gotten from voice acting? What are some of like, some of the least non-helpful director notes that you've ever gotten? Uh, the least are always, it, it's really hard. I think as actors, a lot of the time we spend uh, becoming, in, we become interpreters uh, sometimes of what a client wants. If the director isn't concise about what they want or if the client doesn't know what they want, I think those are the most difficult uh, and challenging sessions when you've got someone saying, oh, no, not that. Um, just give us another. Just do it again. Just do it again. Uh, I need to hear your power, but you have to be softer. <laughs> that, was, that was my favorite one. I was, I was working on some anime, I don't remember what it was, and the director, who was very Japanese, this wonderful lady, goes, Okay, that's good, but hard, but more soft. Okay, cool. Yeah. And a little bit of purple. And a little bit more purple. You're giving me blue and I need yeah. green, yeah. you know? Uh, so that can be very difficult at times. Uh, as, a, as a director, it's sort of our job to translate the confusion that can be with the people behind us, because sometimes there are a lot of people in the room. And it's sort of my job to take all of this information and siphon it into something that is concise and clear that the actor can then use. And every actor, uh, spins off of different things, so every actor has a different key. So you've got to find the key to the actor, the key to all of you know the people behind you, and try and give them exactly what they want. Sometimes, whether if you agree with it or not, that can also be challenging. Yeah. And I love directors like Mary or Chris Zimmerman or Charlie Adler, who will literally just say, "Okay, that was great. Uh, do a better one." <laughs> How about, uh, okay, that was, that was great, just give me one more with talent. Uh, I would do that. It's, it's, I love that. My it, favorite it, is, good, uh, one more, suck less. Suck less. Suck less. Maybe use the words we gave you. Yeah. That would be nice. We pay our writers a lot of money, yeah. so let's uh, keep our investment strong by reading their words. Uh, which is great, you know, it's like, uh, Actors go off on and they, their own improvisational skills are so amazing. Tom Kenny is a genius. He plays SpongeBob and among other million things. And he's one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. We did a session last week. He, I don't know if you, you get to a point when you laugh so hard that you feel like your brain is gonna split in two and you just start crying to the like really ugly crying, laughing. That happened to me last week in the middle of a session. I just had to stop. I mean, I was lost. Yeah, it took a while to start moving again. Yeah. Oh. That was a good moment. Yeah. But good moment. To me, clarity is, is key. If, if I can get something that's clear and awesome from a director, that's great. And if not, then I'll just give some, I'll give a director something that I would be proud to have heard. You know, it's just like, okay, I'm not sure I understand what they want, but I'll try it again and try something a little different, tweak it a little in a different way, and see if that hit what they wanted, you know, because sometimes you just don't know. I don't mind if, it, uh, if the director admits that they don't know what they want necessarily, and then we'll explore it together as a collaborative effort. That's fun. But if a director doesn't know, they won't admit it, and then they make you do something 15, 20 different times, and you know that you nailed it on the first take, 
that's when it gets a little bit annoying. So, and that does happen. It does, you know, just like, I need to get over there! And like, oh, that's good, one more time, hit there. I need to get over there! Perfect. I'm like, didn't I just do that? I just did that. And then you become William Shatner at some point. Yes. I need to get over there. Get it. I need to get to the chopper. I need to get it over there. Get to the chopper. That's his best word to make. That's Shatner's best word. I. <laughs> Sorry. I can do Schwarzenegger all day. No. Hello. That's all you need to do for Schwarzenegger impersonation. Do Schwarzenegger. Hello. It's not animals. Hello. Yeah. Oh, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah. So the other day, you guys answered a question about the most embarrassing moments you've had in the studio. Yeah. So in reverse of that, what are the moments that it felt most triumphant to you? You just get out of the studio and you just can't help but go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You don't, you don't really want to think that way, because when you start thinking that, that you're the best that there is, you, you probably screwed something up. Yeah. Um, I felt most triumphant when I farted in the booth and they didn't realize it, and it is somewhere in Halo. One of my efforts is a <laughs> and I looked up as I did it, and nobody, everybody was still in their script, engineering, and I'm like, are we cool? Like, yeah. It's like, <laughs> Yeah, we've talked about that before. That's, that's, that's a great moment, actually, when you can pull that off. I, uh, when I was, <laughs> the first time I, I voiced Wolverine in X-Men Legends, I farted one, and he was going, uh, just underneath it. And I was really embarrassed, and I thought, oh man, I hope nobody heard that. And now, I, I'm older, I've been doing Wolverine for a really long time, I take great pride in trying to mask a fart in within <laughs> Every single time I throw a punch, I'm just praying for that part to happen. So, as long as you can trust it. Sometimes you can't trust the part. It's a digital Easter egg. And those are great triumphant moments. That to me is like a triumphant moment. But sometimes as a director to have a cast come together and it's it really is lightning in a bottle when, when you get these people working together and you can see how intertwined they are, that the chemistry between everyone and they're feeding off of each other, and it just becomes the greatest performance. You get to watch all of it, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. I mean, those are really wonderful. And then you just hope to God that they recorded it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they miss those. Sometimes all the, the best stuff will happen in rehearsal, and there's an engineer that we're working with now who records absolutely everything. everything. Yeah. And many times that, that magic happens when it's not, the word button is not down, then you go, oh, we can't recreate that, we're not even going to try. Like, I've got a session coming up, but it's with a celebrity, and uh, they're new to voiceover. And so the client says, so we did one session already, it went okay, not really, so we're going to come back, and we want to do a day of rehearsal and then a day of recording. And I said, okay, so we're doing two days of recording then. Because if you're not recording that rehearsal and we find it, it'll be gone. How do you know you can find it the next day? I mean, it could have been, you know, somebody had some bad eggs or something, or mentally something happened the night before, and they're not in the same mindset. When you find that gold, you record it always. Always be recorded. Always be closing. You know, it's always. Well, especially if the actor isn't used to doing voiceover. Yeah. Which this actor is not used to doing voiceover. So if there is some happy accident like that, they may not be able to recreate that. Yeah. So, yeah, because yeah, then they're not, they got a laugh, and the next day they asked for a cup of tea and they got a laugh, and the next day they're asking for a laugh and not a cup of tea, if that makes sense. Wow, that's really deep. <laughs> Don't ask for the laugh, ask for the cup of tea, and you might get the laugh. That's good. We all learned something. Yes. How about you? Is there, for some of the, uh, the companies, did you more free reign over how you interpret, or did you more of a micromanagement? It depends on the client. Uh, I talked a little about this yesterday. There's some clients that are just, I want you to do exactly what I am doing. So much so that uh, my one of the executive producers fired the lead and did the voice themselves with no director. That was interesting. It's like, okay. Uh, but sometimes they'll let us just go off and they say, look, this is an, an outline, make it funny. Sometimes they're like, this is uh, very important that it needs to go like this. We need to have them say this this way because it's the only way to push the story forward in a very specific way. So it really does depend on the client. 
Uh, and especially with anime sometimes, if they cut up, like the Crime Saban was sort of legendary for the Power Rangers, taking footage, cutting it up, remaking it. Digimon, cut it up, re reimagine it. Uh, we just did that with Glitter Force, cut it up, reimagine it. People get mad that it's not true to the original, but it's now westernized to a different audience. Uh, and in that case, they'll say, make it funny. Do whatever you can to make it funny. But like with Naruto, they'll say, stick, stick to the manga. As a writing staff, stick to the manga, and as a series, we want it as close to the original as possible. And that being said, when you have a great director like Mary in the room, we will get it as written. We'll get it with the original intent. And then if we have a great idea, she'll say, okay, give me one as written. Now let's hear what you got. Let's, let's see what you got. And then sometimes that will stick. And some directors are afraid to do that, and she's fearless, so I, I love working with her for that reason, and many other reasons. Ten years. years. <laughs> the last episode of the anime uh, just premiered, and how, how does that feel? <sighs> it's hard. It's it's. I think I left the show around episode six hundred and thirty, and I came in on episode twenty-two. Oh, wow. So that was a long career. That was ten years of Naruto, uh, and then the amazing Jamie Simone, who hired me in the first place, uh, encouraged me when I started getting offers to maybe go into original animation and directing that. He's like, go, go, do it, it's your dream, it's your dream. So I got so busy doing that that I had to let Naruto go. So it was sort of one morning period was done. And then this one is like, ugh, oh, it's, it's, I, there have been full generations born and raised over the course of this series, you know? So it's, it's kind of bittersweet and wonderful, you know, I mean, Dante Bayo, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing show, and what an incredible accomplishment for them to do it, and to keep a female actress playing a boy all the way through his childhood into young adulthood. I think that was kind of amazing. So, bravo, Japan. Bravo, yeah. Bravo, brava. And bravo oh, to Miley Flanagan, and I can't remember her name, I feel so bad, uh, the actress in, in Japan who's played her all of these years. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm just sorry I can't get to play with Miley anymore, which makes me sad. Because we had so much fun in the booth. We've got to play on our own dime now. Yeah. I, I, guess, guys, I, I guess we have time for one more question. God, is, is that, that you? Grandma? <laughs> <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, that, those are the dulcet tones of Mario. Ooh, Mario! You inspired me this weekend. Oh. Yay! Just say hi to a staff member before the weekend is up and just thank them, thank them yeah. because they are you are having fun and in an organized fashion because of what they're doing. So all these people back here who would make us sound so good and everybody's taking care of us and taking care of you guys more importantly, just thank a staff member because most of them are volunteers and they're here out of the love, the same love that you have for anime and everything else. Don't be like us, though. We're taking Mario home with us. He yeah, play. he gets to come with us. <laughs> That's not appropriate to do, but we're going to so, do it. Another Steven Universe question? Sure. Oh, no. But um, what's your favorite song, and can you sing it for us? Oh, I don't know. Oh. I don't know. I don't watch it as much as I should, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Okay. Steven Universe! <laughs> That's my favorite Steven Universe song. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's such a, I hate doing that because it's, again, there's only so many hours in the day. There are so, only so many hours in the day. And I just don't have time to watch every episode of everything that we're doing. It's, it's, it's sort of like, I have to stay present in the moment of, what am I doing tomorrow? Okay, tomorrow I'm doing the Necromancer in the morning and the afternoon. So I've got to just, my brain is on Diablo 3. And then Tuesday it'll be, it'll be untangled, you know, so it's, it's the greatest exercise of being present. And I just, and then I gotta go home and work on other stuff, so I just don't have time to watch everything. But someday, when I'm old and a, and a hoverboard rascal, I'll uh, start watching all the episodes and everything that I didn't get a chance to. So, anyway, thanks you guys so much for coming out. Thank Happy you, Sunday. Everybody. Thank you for having us. And thank you for your generosity. Yeah, you're awesome. Hey, Blue! Yay, that's what we've been, Maddie. Hey, Maddie, we love you. Happy Sunday.
Happy Sunday, guys. Enjoy the last day. We'll be doing one more signing. We'll be signing it from 2 to 3.30. A hard out at 3.30 for us because we've got to go back to L.A. Right. Boo. Thanks, guys. Peace.